Welcome. It has just gone 7 p.m. Wednesday, the 27th of October, and you are watching Regional Wrap, episode 27. Regional Wrap, providing an insight on the issues affecting regional Australia and giving a voice to regional residents. My name is Bill Bates, and joining me on this episode, trees, sacred or simply a sustainable resource, is my guest, Mark Banasayak. Mark is the New South Wales Shooters, Fishers and Farmers Party member, member of the Legislative Council. He was elected in 2019. Previously, Mark was a high school teacher with 15 years experience in New South Wales public schools, receiving recognition in both a regional and ministerial level of excellence in education delivery. Mark has consistently advocated for the timber industry introducing the National Parks and Wildlife Amendment tree finning operations. Bill, within his first year in Parliament, we would see the return of tree finning in the Murray and Palinga National Parks. Mark is now the Chair of New South Wales Parliament Portfolio Committee 4, Regional New South Wales Water and Agriculture, is conducting the inquiry into the long-term sustainability and future of the timber, timber and forest products. He has passionately opposed, <clears throat> opposed the government's state environmental planning policy for whole habitat protection 2019. This policy would see private property rights <clears throat> to clear land taken away from farmers and others subject to and make farmers subject to strict conditions their properties based on poor research and government consultation. As a result of Mark's strong opposition, the policy was dropped. Mark continues to champion private property rights in New South Wales. Since entering politics, Mark has, <clears throat> has offered an alternative voice and a rigid opposition to green policy on the left and right of politics. Keenest of recreational hunters and fishers, Mark has been involved with various associations and groups over, over 15 years. He is currently the chair of the Federation of Hunting, Hunting Clubs, which has grown from 36 to 51 clubs under his leadership. Mark is passionate about advancing the rights <clears throat> and freedoms and cultures of all law-abiding law shooters, fishers and farmers, and understands regional Queens, New South Wales, under the major parties has been getting a raw deal. It's very much similar to Queensland's situation. Welcome, Mark. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me. If we could just start with a little bit of your personal background, um, where, where you uh, were brought up and that, and your, and your education and becoming a teacher and, and some of the moments of that. How did you then move into politics? Yeah, no, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so look, I grew up on the, the south coast of um, New South Wales in a, in, in a suburb called Kiama, right on, right on the beach, um, beautiful place. Um, so I lived there for about 17 years with my family, and then I, I moved up uh, further north to Wollongong to go to university, um, where I started in IT, um, and then quickly realised I hated it. Um, and, and got into edu education. I was always, um, always loved history and, and geography and as, as a kid and um, sort of, you know, sort of fell into, into teaching that um, and you know, started out teaching in Western Sydney, um, did that for about six, seven years and, and then got time off for good behaviour and, and, and got a job down back on the coast. Um, always sort of teaching in sort of low socioeconomic schools and, um, you know, really, really working to try and um, improve those, the, those communities um, and improve educational opportunities for those communities. And I like to think I was fairly successful in doing that. As I think you referenced, um, I received sort of director level uh, recognition um, for that work. Um, so obviously during, during the latter years of that, um, that career, I, I started getting into uh, shooting and hunting through my brother-in-law who um, was quite active in it and, um, you know, was sort of 
you know, asking me to come out and do stuff with him. And, and then I eventually caved in and, and, and I sort of never looked back in terms of, you know, getting out in the bush and shooting and hunting. And um, yeah, so I was doing that for a few years in, in the local, local shooting club and the Shooters, Fishers, Farmers party sort of tapped me on the shoulder and said, well, do you want to, do you want to help us out at, at the next election? And I said, yeah, sure. So I, I started um, coordinating the how to vote, uh, you know, volunteers for the Illawarra and, and, and did that quite well. And because I did that quite well, they said, well, join the committee. Um, so I did, I did that. And then, you know, like a lot of these, you know, volunteers. They just reel you in. Yeah, they just reel you in. You know, everyone else steps back and you're the, you're the person uh, standing forward. Um, but yeah, so like I was involved in that for quite a few years and then um, sort of moved through the ranks of the committee and became uh, the deputy chair and then chair. Um, and I sort of joke, I'm the shortest serving chair of the New South Wales party because um, I think it was about three or four months after I took the chair, um, I got pre-selected and, and elected um, into parliament. So I then had to stand down from the chair's position and, and take an ex-officio role. So um, yeah, but I, I think I was involved, I've been involved in the party for about 10, 12 years before I um, was pre-selected. So well and truly worked my way through the ranks in terms of, you know, just doing, I guess, basic volunteer roles to where I am now. So it's, it's, it's been quite a journey. The, um, I have looked at the structure of the shooters, farm, uh, fishers and farmers. And I mean, it was originally just the shooters, then it became the shooters and fishers. And then it became the shooters, fishers and farmers. And the structure is you're incorporated in associations in each state, uh, which is a little bit different how the majors are and some of the other, other, other parties are. They have an umbrella organisation over the top, uh, either registered as a company or a private limited uh, with asset. And then the other, other branches in each state are then uh, locked into that system, but you're still operating on the separate in incorporated uh, associations. How do you find that works in regards to um, keeping uh, on top of your policies and make sure uh, the Queensland Association is well informed of what your, your position is on different sorts of policies? Uh, because it would have to be a, a person to person or organization to organization uh, feed. Yeah, look, we, um, it, as I said, it's, it is a bit different to the other parties, but I think it gives us the flexibility um, to tailor our, our, our policies um, per state um, because obviously there are some, there are some different situations and, and, and different, um, I guess, bills and legislations within each, each state. So, um, it gives us that flexibility. Um, I guess we manage it through, you know, good communication and regular communication with our, with our state branches and our, and, and with them, within them, their, their local branches within their own states. Um, you know, we have our, we have state specific policies and we have federal policies. Um, but, you know, I think the way we've set it up, it actually gives our states a, a, a little bit of autonomy to, to tailor um, their approach to suit the, you know, the electorates they're trying to represent and the states that they're trying to represent. So look, well, for us, it works. I suppose the situation is too, because you're a minor party, you're not going to take government on that. So you've got to deal with the policies that um, the governments and the major parties are putting out there and yeah. how to address those. And I suspect like, like in Queensland, we, a couple of years ago, we had the Vegetation Management Act amendment uh which was a big issue and then like you had a little bit later you had the, the koala situation in uh, so like you say it does allow that flexibility to address that those specific um policies that have been put forward by the government at a certain time without without too much sort of having to work out what other people do and you can actually address address that so i, I presume that's one part of the flexibility you really like about the organisation there. Yeah, we, we do. And I, I think um, parties can get too tied down or, or, or tied to policies. Um, and that's not to say that you shouldn't have policies. You, you need to stand for something. But 
I think you still you, you need that flexibility, particularly as a minor party. You need to, you know, obviously adapt to the landscape that's being put in front of you by by the government of the day. Um, I think if you if you if you're too rigid, um, you, you sort of get tied to a, a particular viewpoint, and you know things change, research changes. Um, so you should be able to, you know, adapt to that. And I think this, yeah, way we're structured that allows us to do so. Well, I suppose the next cab off the rank, buddy, is going to be the federal election. So um, you see uh, the shooters, fishers, and farmers contesting a number of uh, federal seats and and going for a, a Senate spot. Yeah, look, we've always sort of tried a hand at the Senate spot, um, and obviously the both the two majors have have made it difficult for minor parties to achieve any sort of success at a federal federal level. Um, but yeah, look, we, we are looking at contesting um, some of the some of the other seats as well, um, particularly around you know areas where we, we now have lower house members in New South Wales um, to essentially build on that that um, that presence we have in, in those areas. Um, and we're also looking at local government as well. In, the, in those areas where we have lower house members. So, so we can have a, a presence all the way through the three tiers of government. So our, you know, our, state, our state members can support our local government members and our federal members can support um, them down the line as well. That's, I guess that's the aim, um, or one of the aims we're looking at in, in terms of contesting oh, the federal. A bit later in the program, we'll move back to sort of 2019, like, uh, state election and your success there. But at the moment, if we just move into the timber industry, can you yep. give us a bit of a overview of uh, what the inquiry is about and what the hopes to be achieved? And also, um, what's the sort of response from industry? Are they sort of um, happy to be there uh, and hoping that they get, get some uh, improvement in their situation? Uh, because in, in Queensland we have these inquiries too. <laughs> we don't have an upper house, um, so so you always know how it's going to end, and it's usually going to end badly for for farmers or foresters. That because the, the going out and the consultation and inquiry is just something that needs to be done, but it's not going to change things. We, like I'm putting case was the Vegetation Management Act amendment. There was, um, I think, about 20 odd regional um, meetings uh, from Long Reach to Mount Isa, all up and down the coast. And I think there was 722 submissions. <laughs> but guess what? Not one change, one word in the act was changed. You know, it was going through no matter what uh, they put up. So, how do you sort of reconcile? your situation in New South Wales by having that upper house and at least hopefully being able to sort of get some sense or, or fairness in, into the forthcoming bills and legislation. Yeah, look, that's, yeah, that's a, a really good set of questions there, Bill. Um, I guess to go to the first part, the, the, the inquiry is really taking a deep dive um, into the industry. It's fairly broad in its terms of reference um, because it is a fairly it is a fairly broad industry and it, for New South Wales it it covers across the whole state. You know, we have you know, forest, timber and forest um, industries on the south coast of Eden, right up to the mid-north coast out to the central west and, and the northwest of New South Wales um, and it has obviously significant flow and effects to our building industry um, you know, it's a significant exporter as well. You know, in terms of um, regional employment, it numbers at around 22,000 people directly employed. And that's obviously not counting in obviously the, the secondary employment through truck driving and, and, and other, other secondary employments. Um, so we really are taking a deep dive uh, into it because it does, you know, there are some significant issues, not, not, not just the bushfires that have recently occurred, but um, there were concerns about supply before that. Um, and obviously with COVID and exports um, being sort of 
hamp or hindered, um, you know, it's it's only sort of got worse. So it really is a, a deep dive. But in, in in terms of, I guess, how our inquiries may differ to the up to the the Queensland situation because we have an upper house, and in particular in New South Wales at the moment, the government doesn't control the upper house, um, which isn't great for the government, but it's great for everybody else um, because we can actually really push. Um, you know certain issues through when the government actually has to come and, and talk to us with their legislation and, and we can move some significant amendments in our in our house um so look i do get the cynicism from people about inquiries because they do see these you know big talk fests happen or these tick box exercises in terms of consultation and then then nothing happens um and that's not to say New South Wales we don't have that. We we do have some inquiries where yeah, you know we'll 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 put out a report and the government will just ignore it um, or respond to it in a way and say oh yeah we recognise your your recommendations but we're going to ignore them. Um, but I, I guess for me it's what you do with that that inquiry report and the findings from that inquiry afterwards that I think counts. So most politicians are really good at talking and not, not really good at doing stuff afterwards. So, but my view is, you know, I'll talk about the issue um, like it needs to be talked about, but then I'll actually put legislation in place based on what I've, what I've found or what I've um, uncovered through an inquiry or, or an investigation. Um, and as you said, in my introduction, you've, I've done that through the um the tree thing bill i put forward I, I did it through the koala set bill i put forward and the environmental planning and another bill an environmental planning assessment um uh bill too so i think it's what the individual member does with what they discover out the, out of those inquiries that's probably more important um uh, yeah just in i i did a little bit of research on the australian timber industry which is, is a pretty pathetic industry in comparison to, to um, Finland and, and its operation. But 86% of timber in Australia, old timber in Australia, is plantation. That means we're only allocating 14% of timber that we, we're, we're cutting down comes from actual native forest. Um, this, that must be a very small portion of the forest we've got. Um, how, how come it's got to a situation now that the flavour or the, or the push of government is to lock up and lock up and lock up more, more public land a, from commercial interest and then the second part of it, they also seem to be pretty keen in locking it up from public use as well. So if you can give us a bit of an idea of how the timber industry is fared, not so much in the plantation because plantations are plantation sort of thing, but what we've got to really look at is, is native forest, the amount of wood that's, uh, timber that's available, how we're utilising it, and what happens if we don't actually utilise it like we should? Mm. Yeah, well, if if you allow me, I'll share a screen um, that was comes from a Timber New South Wales submission, um, and it it looks at the availability of timber supply over the years. This is only in New South Wales, um, and you see there that the unavailability for timber supply has gradually increased. Um, while the available timber supply in, in public native forests has um, significantly decreased. And it's pure, it's purely political, um, Bill. Um, it's, it's about carrying the green vote in, um, in a city. Well, and just, just look, looking at that graph. Yeah. Uh, if, you, if you move to 2015-16, uh, uh, what it's showing there is uh, probably about a... Thousand, a thousand oh, would be a million hectares, I suppose. Yeah, uh, a million hectares of forest is available for for uh, tim timber industry. Yeah, for, for forestry, and what they've got there, they've locked, got a lock up of approaching 
eight million uh, hectares. So it could, could be made available. Um, that, that's fairly dramatic uh, in regards to it doesn't give you much to harvest if they keep doing that to you. And no, well, like that's, I say, yeah, that's that's right. Um, you know, even if they released, you know, a third of that, or, or, or you know, or twenty percent of that, it would have a, a significant impact um, in terms of uplift of, of, of the timber industry. Um, but look, as I as I said to you, it's it's purely political. Um, and lot, I, I raised this when the koala set was brought up in in uh, New South Wales last year, and there was a uh, labor set labor member of parliament um, in 2011, and he went down to the River Redgum uh, National Park that had just been made by his, his government. And he actually said, and I'll quote you this, he said, let me give you a lesson in politics. The Greens hold 15% of the vote. And if we are to stay in power, we must hold their preferences to maintain city seats. They want significant national park in Redgum. So um, that was the sole rationale for creating a lot of these national parks which now, as you said, you can't actually access, um, not only for the timber industry, but it's becoming harder and harder for just the general public to access it for recreation. Um, so it's, yeah, it's really frustrating to hear, you know, to read quotes like that. Um, but, you, but, but you would think the job of a government, right, for all the land that's in a country, it should be deriving a dividend for the people. Now, a dividend doesn't necessarily have to mean a commercial operation. A dividend can simply be um, amenity and let recreation, enjoyment, whatever, but using the facility, that's a dividend for the public. Now, and even for land that's <laughs> basically useless, you, know, you get a dividend by using it as a weapons range or a booming range, that's still a dividend for the for the country. But if, if you're just locking up a great big mass of land and no one's entering it, and basically you're just leaving it to its own devices, uh, and unfortunately these days, um, with advent of uh, immigration and, and goods coming in, we've got noxious weeds, we've got feral animals and that, so if you just lock up a piece of land, it's only got to one, go one way, and that's deteriorate. And usually it's not good for hey, the nat natural uh, fauna and flora of the area anyway. So a, ma a managed situation would be better than an unmanaged situation. Up here in uh, northern Queensland, we've had a lot of um, NGOs like... Uh, Wildlife Foundation and the conservation groups come in and buy up land up on the Cape and then just lock it up and leave it. So there's, there's no management plan. There's no one there to look after it or observe what's going on at all. And it's basically feral pigs, feral dogs, feral cats, noxious weeds, and it just keeps going. Do you think... We, we need legislation to say, well, even though you, you've bought land and, you, and you're not going to utilise it, well, then you should be penalised. If you're not going to get an output or provide a dividend for the people of Australia, well, then we'll, we'll hit you with a, um, a levy uh, because you're not doing anything. Uh, I think years ago, even in residential land, when people used to have vacant blocks and hold them, hold them, I think there was actually a higher rating uh, cost on vacant blocks to encourage people to develop. I think we need something like that to stop these NGOs thinking that they can just buy land and just lock it up to deteriorate. Yeah, look, I, I think that's certainly something worth exploring. Um, like in New South Wales, you know, we sort of see national parks, well, my party sort of sees national parks as the, as the place where biodiversity goes to die. Um, as you said, it just becomes choked up. It be, it becomes almost monocultural and most of that culture is, is introduced uh, pest species. And um, the native species don't really have a chance to thrive and survive. And um, look, I certainly think we do need to look at, you know, 
you know, land that's been unused or un underutilized and um, just just locked up. And that, that was sort of the, the rationale behind my tree thing uh, bill, because essentially what it did was essentially replicating what the Aboriginal fire stick, fire stick management has done for thousands of years. Um, and there's, there's data from our local, uh, from our state-based Department of Primary Industries that actually shows that tree thinning in national parks, um, and they did studies over three or four years, it, it actually has a positive impact on, on biodiversity. Um, because as you may know, Bill, trees need uh, you know, space to grow, uh, not only with their root structures, but obviously with their canopies and, and all that. So um, there's an optimum spacing between trees that allows them to grow to their peak level. And then obviously that, if they're spaced adequately, that also allows the, you know, the understory and the, and the small shrubs and, and wild grasses to actually to grow to their potential which then becomes home for our native species, um, which is what we want. Um, so that was the whole basis behind that tree thinning bill was to A, create an industry, um, you know, or a supplement industry to the forest products industry, um, but also improve biodiversity in, in our national parks. Um, unfortunately, the, the government of the day um, chose not to support it, um, but it's certainly something that we'll, we'll keep pushing on. Um, but yeah, I don't, you know, I think we do need to explore, you know, ways of, of encouraging better utilisation of, of our, of our land um, and particularly, yeah, particularly our, our national parks and our reserves, um, whether it's, you yeah, know, for recreation or amenity um, or for, you know, small industry. With the, with the inquiry, uh, can you give us an idea of sort of, number of um, people who are who, who are presenting at the inquiry or putting in submissions and and their areas because when we had the natural uh, when we had the vegetation management act you know, of course there was a lot of landowners but then there was a lot of environmental science science people in regards to of course those entrenched on the green but there was also uh, people who who had actually forester experience or land management experience. Um, and one of the people was a guy called Bill Burrows. And he had a history with the Department of Agriculture or, or whatever over uh, decades in that. And he submitted a paper on regards to exactly what you're talking about, you know, uh, regrowth that needs to be thinned out because it actually chokes up, up the environment and the things like it stops, like you're saying, it stops other trees from reaching their peak because there's so much competition with all this um, uh, regrowth. But not only that, leaf litter, especially from gum trees, <laughs> and my brother hates gum trees because he's a turf farmer and lays instant lawn. And if there's anything that will kill, kill lawn, it's a gum tree and it's litter. So what happens is you have this regrowth that gets quite dense and then it has a lot of leaf litter and that actually stops uh, the growth of the um, grasses. And as soon as you stop the grasses growing, the next thing you get is erosion. A lot of people think if you haven't got trees, you have erosion, but it, it's actually grass that stops erosion. And people have lost, I mean, well, I don't know who, who's supposed to remember this, but it is, it's just something grass is the thing that binds the earth yes trees do a great job on hillsides by locking up make sure you don't have landslips and that but the actual on the flat plains it's grass that holds the ground together and, and stops that soil erosion not the trees yeah look i, I just to go back to the, the start there um the the inquiries had probably close to over three or close to 300 submissions um and it, it it's been a bit of a broad church. Obviously, we've had the industry, we've had the environmental uh, groups, you know, some of which you've mentioned, um, you know, up in Queensland, the World Wildlife Foundation. Um, and obviously, we've had ac academics as well. Um, we've yet to have the government appear before us. Um, they're coming in uh, November um, for, a, for a brief hearing, and then we'll have a follow-up with them at, uh, next year. Um, but we're also got about uh, five or six site visits planned as well. 
um, going out and seeing the industries. So they're going out to the timber mills, uh, going out to some of these forests um, and, and seeing them in action. And um, that was supposed to happen or start this year, but obviously with COVID, that's that's impacted that. So we'll we'll start them up in the new year. Um, but yeah, we'll be we'll be meeting with former forestry workers, current forestry workers, um, Aboriginal groups. Um, you know that all have a an interest in the area. So it's a fairly fairly broad spectrum of of stakeholders that we've that we've had. And um, yeah, it's it's we've had some significant submissions um, from from most of them. So it's um, yeah, it's been good. It'd be interesting in regards to the timber industry because there's had have been a lot of advances in the timber industry, but I don't, I don't know if they equate to what's going on in Australia. But I've seen overseas, like in the United States, and that they've gone away from the a lot of areas have gone away from the old days when you just went out a chainsaw and just popped the tree and then chucked it on the back of a truck and, and shift it out. They're actually got more or less portable mills that you can move into the forest and actually on site they can actually get it down to sawn timber if, if that's the category of uh, timber they're felling. Uh, well, that, that application would depend, would depend on the type of timber you, you're cutting down because other timber you need brown, brown logs for wood chipping and things like that. So there's a difference. But is, have you heard or got any idea from the timber industry that of improved technology or improved management practices that are likely to sort of carry favour going ahead? Um, well, we have we have heard a, a, a bit of that. Um, they still believe that there's more to do in that space. And that was um, that came pretty that came through pretty strongly that we need to improve our civil culture in, in, in this state or in, in Australia um, more broadly. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, you're talking about this, the on, on-site milling, um, I think is something that we probably need to explore more of because one of the things that did come through is quite strongly was that our, that our supply chain um, is so, so far stretched. And if you look historically, um, a lot of a lot of the um, mills were set up around forests, and and so they would take them, you know, they they would take the wood and you know drive a short distance to to the mill and process it there, and then um, ship it off or, or do whatever they needed to with it. Where now it's become stretched, which obviously then increases the costs, which then obviously makes the industry less less profitable. So. That's, I think, something that we really need to going to need to explore, um, so the industry can remain remain viable. Um, because at the moment we're 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 doing silly things like you know harvesting in in Tumbarumba on the south coast and and then shipping it up to <laughs> um, the mid north coast for processing, um, and that's that's to do with also our wood supply agreements that have been set up by this government, you know and. And and I guess the not getting the mix right of of the species of trees, um, and and getting that even mix in all the geographical areas, um, if that makes sense. So that's really had a this a significant impact on on our supply chain. So yeah, I think we need to take a real deep look at that um, because it is impacting the commercial viability. So, so the inquiry is is primarily dealing with the public forest uh, forest, not the plantations is uh, are they in the mix in the conversation or is it just just the public access land? No look it, it's it's both it's it's looking at our, at our at our native forests as well as our softwood plantations as well as also looking at um, what we have in New South Wales in terms of private native forestry so individual farmers having um, their I guess their own plots. Of, of private native forests that they harvest. Um, so as I said, it's a, fair, it's a really deep dive. Um, most, most people are saying that we need more softwood plantation to keep up with the demand. Um, you know, that's something that both sides of the argument are, are calling for. Um, where they obviously part ways is um, when it comes to the native um, hardwood 
and obviously the green groups don't want yeah, any any native hardwood. They just want a, a total transition to to softwood, and um, obviously the the industry actually wants uh, you know a, a greater mix and actually want greater access to to native native hardwood. And you, if I go back to that graph I showed you earlier, I think it, it is needed if we're going to you know get close to being com you know competitive with places like Finland. Um, you know, I'll, we do need to look at that. And soft and softwood timber isn't the answer for every forest product we use. Um, so we do need a mix of of you know softwood and and hardwood. And I'd hate for us to go down the the track of Victoria, where they've basically forced a transition to total softwood. Um, you know, with this Chardonnay socialist idea that you know we'll get our hardwood timber from you know, the Amazon where they kill orangutans, but at least we don't need to see it. It's, or Borneo. Yeah. But, but, but that's the narrow narrow thinking of these people in the green sphere is, right, the world has a demand for hardwoods and it, and you can't get rid of that demand. It, it's just there. So by us not uh, putting in our share, puts pressure on places where there's worse practice, worse practices like in Borneo and the Amazon like and that so they, they stump up a greater share but the other thing is if we don't harvest if we don't harvest the timber from our hardwood forest or our natural forest they just continue to grow and the only thing they're good for is either getting to old age dying and rotting and becoming carbon dioxide and methane or just become a big bushfire so it seems you know, counterproductive, especially in this day and age where everyone's going on about carbon dioxide and you need to sequester it now. Well, trees would have to be the greatest sequester of carbon dioxide going, provided it's a new tree. So you think, all right, harvest an old tree because it's getting towards its end of its life anyway, and it's good timber. Um, it's it's not going to suck up much more carbon over the next before it actually. Uh, falls over in the forest and whereas if you cut it down plant another tree it's going to suck up carbon you know, two or three times that the rate so there's a net benefit you would think <laughs> i think you could try to sell them on, on that or they just it's just basically no no trees are got no nat native trees are going to get cut down yeah, but it's it's yeah, it's a bizarre position they have with that because yeah, they do sort of sprout the virtues of you know carbon sequestration um, with trees, but they ignore the re all the research, particularly overseas re research, that says you need a you need a forest that has a mix of old growth and new growth trees to maximise um, that potential. Um, and as you said, once a tree falls over and rots, then you know all the all the carbon is then spewed out into the atmosphere, or if it's burnt. So, same thing, but if you if you harvest a you know a native hardwood tree, you know when it reaches optimum its optimum age, um, then that carbon is then locked in that product. And then, as you said, you plant a new tree and you start the process again. And it's about managing that mix, so you always have that maximum you know carbon sequestration, but also you maximise your your output in terms of um, your timber industry. Um, you know. The opportunity is there to get the mix right. We just uh, we, we don't seem to have the right political appetite, um, <laughs> political mix at the moment to, to, to do it. If I could just, just move on to the Finnish uh, timber industry, just to do a bit of comparison that and show you basically how far we are behind in actually forest management and getting value for money. Um, I'll just share a screen now. This is from the government publication, and it's basically talking about from stump to market. Now, that's about the best I could have uh, image I could get out of that publication. Uh, but what I've done in the next image, what I've done is actually made those figures more readable. But basically, um, the volume of growing stock they got is 2.5 billion cubic metres. That's their growing stock in their forest. Now, in any one year, this is 2018, 
commercial felling was 65 million cubic metres. Oh, I've got square metres there, that's wrong. That should be cubic metres. Um, I have to learn me volumes and, and areas. Um, now that, and they also imported timber as well. So they imported uh, 9.5 million cubic metres of timber into the mix as well. Uh, now, saw, saw logs, they have 28 million cubic metres of saw logs. And I think the total of Australia saw logs, you know, is something like, like 12 um, across Australia. <laughs> and the thing is, Finland only has 23 million hectares of forest, and we've got 100, 134 million uh, hectares of forest. So <laughs> we're getting nothing out of our forest compared to what the Finns get out of theirs. And then they turn in uh, 36 uh, million cubic metres into pulp. And then that pulp goes over to make, of course, uh, export. They export the pulp, but they also make uh, uh, paperboard and paper. So they get a massive uh, value adding in, in their product. Whereas I don't, I think all our wood chips are sent, sent overseas for processing. Uh, I think Tasmania was at the Tamar Valley, they had a chance to put in a, one of the uh, uh, most modern uh, paper mills in, in the world, but the Greenies stopped that. Whereas now those wood chips still get sent to Japan rather than being made into paper in Australia and adding value. Um, and then you can see uh, 1. million cubic metres of plywood and there's another 12 million, uh, 12 million cubic metres of thorn wood products. So they, they just, <laughs> a small country with a small forest area is actually you know, making us look silly. Yeah, it's, look, it's actually quite embarrassing, isn't it? Looking at, the, at those figures. <laughs> um, like, and as you, as you said, they've got, you know, they're outperforming us and they're outperforming us with a, a significantly smaller, um, I guess, you know, resource to, um, to draw from. It's, it, it's truly embarrassing. And, and if you look at, you know, the, the Timber New South Wales submission, they actually, they actually touch on, a, on this in terms of the potential that this industry has. And they've quoted that if we get the, the supply issue sorted out, if we get the, you know, the technology sorted out, if we get the right mix of for, um, timber products where we're utilising um, the, the timber in a more efficient way, in a better way, and, and, and looking at the circular economy of timber, it can actually create 150,000 new timber industry jobs just in New South Wales. Like that, that is massive. That is absolutely massive. Um, but you know, if you look at New South Wales, as I said at the moment, we're employing 22,000 people. I think in Queensland, I had a quick quick study early, earlier on before I came on. I think you employ around 8,800. Um, I'm not too sure about Victoria. Um, There's probably none now. Probably, yeah, probably. Plantations. Probably none now. Um, so it's, we are seriously under, underperforming and underutilizing um, the resource we have. And if you go back to, I think, your original, one of your original comments at the beginning where you said, you know, is it, is it, is it sacred or is it a sustainable resource? Well, I think if you look at how our, our Aboriginal um population and they would say that it why can't it be both um because you know they've historically treated treated it as both it, you know it was you know it did have sacredness to them and still does but they also said saw it as a sustainable resource um and they knew if they managed it properly through fire stick management and and um you know i guess selective selective thinning through that fire stick um that it reaped rewards for them not necessarily in a commercial sense, but in, in an environmental sense. Um, you know, it allowed the, you know, the native grasses to come through, which then attracted the animals, which then they, they then hunted. So, um, as I said, I think, you know, it, it can be both. 
but we're just not allowing it to be both. I think the other embarrassing thing is too, I mean, with Finland, it's in the near the Arctic Circle, so it's a pretty cold area and it's got slow growth. I mean, Australia, we're, we've got a, a warm temperate climate, uh, plenty of sunshine, a lot of areas have got a lot of rain, some areas don't have a lot of rain, but there's plenty of growth, growth potential. And because carbon dioxide's increased from about 300 parts per, 360 parts per million since 1986 to 400 parts per million, satellite imagery shows that um, the green cover of our planet has increased 15%, both in spread and density. So we've got magnificent growing conditions. We've got plenty of atmospheric plant food around for the trees, plenty of sunshine and water. They've got to grow pretty well. So we should be getting in and harvesting them and, and growing new ones, you would think. No, you would think and you would hope. But um, as a, I come back to my point, it's, it's about the political... Um, motivation to, to do it or political inclination to do it and that um, certainly in New South Wales it's they're, they're too busy tracing the inner city green vote um, and they think they can they can win that over by you know using the the koala as uh, as a, a charismatic animal and, and using it as a political weapon um, where you know and you see that in in stupid Policies. Like I think I was in I was in budget estimates um, last year, and the the Department of Primary Industries made this stupid statement where they said, in the absence of scat and scratchings, we just assume that the koalas are there. So, <laughs> like, for all the hunters that are listening, they'd be shaking their heads because if you if you hunted on that principle, you would never see a bloody animal to shoot. <laughs> Um, because in the, if there's no if there's if there's no scat and there's no markings, the animals aren't there. They're not even transitioning through to go to another area. But this was the mentality, um, and you know. And if you look at real scientific research um, on, on on this this issue, um, you know, it'll tell you that koalas have gone through this natural boom and bust cycle. Um, and, and this is shown, dated all the way through, all the way back to colonial times, um, where koalas would just go through, yeah, through this natural boom and bust cycle, where they would go into an area that had optimum conditions for them. They'd breed up um, to the point where, you know, they couldn't sustain that population and then they'd go through this natural crash. And that's continued to happen. Um, and it's actually the locking up of, of these forests and not managing them well that has actually detracted from um, the, the koala population growth and that's and that's come come forward in in a natural resource commission uh, report just recently released in New South Wales where it actually talks about that the best forests for koala population are forests that have been sustainably harvested for timber because it has the right mix of young and old trees uh, for the, that the koalas like. So you know, the research is showing one thing and our politicians uh, are just going the other way because you know, they're worried about the hysterical shrieking of, of inner city greens. I understand the politician mentality in regards to, they wanna, wanna get in power and stay in power and they've got it, they try to seek um, votes from all sorts of minority groups. So they, they appease them and hope that they will, you know, at least put them, prefer, prefer them before the next other major party. But to me, government's role in regards to Australian land is to ensure we get a dividend from the land. Now, a dividend doesn't necessarily have to be monetary in regards to a commercial operation, but in regards to all public land, which the government should be out there ensuring we get this dividend, whether it's uh, either for recreation or amenity in regards to some public parks that are uh, sort of not ever going to be put uh, into the commercial mix. And it's the same with our, our um, coastal wine and things like that. Uh, it's, it should be incumbent on them to ensure that people get amenity and use of it. 
Um, and then, of course, for other lands than that, they should be trying to get a commercial dividend if, it, if, if there's a sustainable uh, industry that can go in, into there. So I think this, this focus of politicians um, on it simply getting votes is, you know, obviously counterproductive, but is there anything we can sort of do to say, well, well, this is this is constitution, this is what you should do, get something in there to say, well, you've got to get the best out of the land for, for the people. I mean, if, if, if we don't want to use the land, well, then why not just give it to China? They'll do something with it. <laughs> well, they certainly will. Um... Yeah, look, I think you're. I think you're right, Bill. I don't know whether I had the answer in terms of how you get the government to to, to see that they're they're caught in this obsession with the election cycle, where they make all these grand promises to get elected, and then they spend the next two 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 years or three years, you know, dragging out delivering those promises, and in some cases recycling those promises for the next election, um, and we never actually really. Get any get anywhere? There's there's no real strategic thought um, past that two year three year cycle. So we don't seem to have any sort of long term political vision, or we don't seem to have any long term political follow through on some of these some of these issues. Um, and we we do need that, particularly for when you when you talk about land management, because it's not something that happens overnight. Um, and you look at the timber industry, you know, a, a softwood, a softwood plantation um, is a 25 to 30 year process. A hardwood plantation, you know, a hardwood tree is a 50 year process. Um, so it's the, you know, the settings that we get right now, you know, we'll see the benefit of in, you know, 25, 30 years or 50 years in um, down the future. Um, but if you've got a government that's obsessed with, you know, a two, three year, projection we'll, we'll never we'll never get there um, and yeah look I think you're right we do need um, a mix of you know I, I think we need to see greater benefit or greater utilization of, of our land um, otherwise yeah we will we will lose it someone else will see the benefit and come in and, and take it um, and as you said the it, it can be about amenities it could be about recreation it can be about co commercial um, benefit um, but it, you know, it needs to be a mix. It can't be just one or the one or the other. And I think the frustration I see is the the green groups seem to push this concept of eco tourism um, quite heavily, but always overstate. Uh, it's, oh, it, yeah, it's economic uh, contribution. The economic contribution that they state never really seems to eventuate. But we we destroy other industries based on this. <laughs> this projected uh, benefit that never, never, never turns up. Um, so, you know, we, we need to get we need to get the mix right. Um, it can't but, just be one or the other. But we, we have, I think, uh, Cairns. There was a, a eco tourism uh, development going to happen up in the Grander Range between Cairns and uh, the Tablelands, and I think they'll go. The Singapore company was going to spend in the vicinity of. At six hundred million dollars, making this eco tourism, but but even the local greenies couldn't couldn't handle that, you know, because it, because it didn't fit didn't fit the rainforest mold, so it didn't go ahead. But just before we move on to other subjects, I'd just like to share a screen in regards to uh, the Finnish operation of uh, timber, and it's basically how this timber operation works in regards to ownership. And it's and it's quite interesting. Interesting. Oops, oops. Not that one. Finnish forests are owned by the Finns. About 60% of the productive forest in Finland is actually owned by people, people in, in the private sector. Uh, it's families of small owners, their spouses, as well as shareholders and deceased estate. That means about 14% of the populations are forest owners. So it's quite interesting that 
so much of the forest is actually in private hands um, and, and getting a benefit. And the state only owns 20%, 26% of the total uh, forest under, under their state, state forest company. So a typical Finnish holding is very small in size. The number of holdings over two hectares is three, 344,000 and the average size is, is 30 hectares. So obviously it must work for them to get the, the volume of product out of, out of their forest in those small private ownership systems. So it's definitely a model probably we should look, look at and it would certainly um, employ more people and actually give an income to more people than what our current industry is giving. Yeah, look, I think that's yeah, I think that's really interesting, Bill. That's something worth definitely worth exploring. Um, you know, and it, it sort of conjures up images of you know, you know, small you know, small businesses. They know their product really well. They 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 care for their product. You know, they're invested in it. Um, you know, quite often when you see these small industry, you know, small cottage industries, um, you know, they take great pride in the product that they produce. Um, and, and often you see with larger, large operations that pride sort of disappears. Um, so I, I think it's something definitely worth exploring. I don't, you know, I don't know the exact, figures, I don't know the exact figures to hand in terms of, um, in, in New South Wales, what our, our, what percentage is state owned versus private native forestry, but I highly suspect it's significantly state owned, um, mm. you know, and um, the private native forest we, we do have is constantly un, under under threat and attack, particularly, you know, in New South Wales recently with this koala step, it was a direct attack on private native forestry. But in regards to the value of hardwood, you know, like if, if, a, if a, a family uh, unit just owns, say, 30 hectares, like uh, some of their sizes, but maybe 30... 30 hectares of ironwood. Now, <laughs> I saw a price of timber the other day and a piece of iron, iron bark or whatever it is, ironwood, it was a metre, a metre, I think it was about a uh, 100 mil by 100 mil square, $130 a metre. Like, you'd be sitting on a gold mine, wouldn't you, with 30 hectares of you know, iron bark wood or some of the other, other hardwoods. Yeah, look, yeah, there's great potential, great potential in it, and the, the the government should be encouraging that sort of investment um, because it, it keeps people employed in our in our small towns, which then improves other amenities um, in those towns. You know, we we know that you know the the greatest indicator of how how a town or how a regional area is is performing is its population. So you know you lose industries or you lose investment, and you 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 lose schools, you lose hospitals, um, you lose people from, and then you lose further people from the, the, the community. So I think the government should be definitely looking at how we can get small, uh, you know, small time investment in some of these um, these timber plantations. Um, you know, in New South Wales at least, the government was contemplating privatising the um the hardwood and, and softwood plantations um and it was only the bushfires that sort of stopped them from doing that so um if they were going to go down that track i would you would hope that they would you know give local people the first opportunity rather than flogging it off to china oh well, yeah well it's a big big outfit so i mean it's obviously the way it works in, in uh, finland is People only have a small holding, so they have a very interested, vested interest in that parcel mm. to make sure harvest is sustainable. And I bet you they're out there making sure the little little seedlings or the what they're planted develop and you know, to the nth degree to make sure that they nothing bad befalls them. So I, I just think that sort of um, model is something you know that probably should definitely be looked at in Australia. Considering we've got such such vast forest area, um, if we can just wrap up, just finish up with any other comments on that before we move on to 
a little bit about the shooters, fishers and farmers and the 2019 electoral success. Yeah, okay. Um, well, look, no, I think we've I think we've rounded off that pretty well. I think I agree with you. I mean, we need to invest in those industries. So let's let's crack on with the 2019 election topic. Okay. Um, little. I know I had Robert on a few weeks ago, so I got a little bit of understanding in regards to how the shooters shooters party was formed in its initial concept, and then it's I think it was a little bit uh, probably a 2000 and. 12 or something, the mood to fishers and farmers. And it was, you know, I think as late as 2016, uh, shooters and fishers. And then 2016, I think it became shooters, fishers and farmers. Uh, am I roughly right with that? Yeah, look, I, yeah, I, I think you are right with those those dates. Um, I'm sure Robert will correct me tomorrow if, if I got it wrong. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I got it wrong. It's all right, blame me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So no, I think you are you are right with those those, those dates. Um, and yeah, and it was a it was a bit of an evolution. Um, we picked up fishermen um, because obviously we have a natural as shooters and hunters we have a natural affinity also with with fishing. Many of us that you know shoot and hunt also fish. Um, you know, it's just on a different just on a different surface essentially. Um, so we picked them up. And um, you know, started representing representing them, and then yeah, in 2016, and I think it was around the time that our government or the, the government at the time tried to bring through native vegetation laws um, that were quite uh, negative towards farmers, and um, this was this was being brought in by a liberal national government, um, you know, and the nationals are supposed to represent farmers, um, and they were actually essentially sitting there silent while their coalition partners was, were doing this. And, and you saw New South Wales farmers as an association essentially in, in the parliament turn their back on, on the nationals and show some extreme displeasure towards them. So, you know, and even before that, we obviously, you know, heard from the regions that, that they felt a bit neglected. You know, some of these seats have been held by nationals for 60, 70, odd years and obviously they got comfortable um, in those positions and, and, and weren't treating the people with the respect um, that they deserved because they you know, thought they would just automatically get elected. So that's why we decided to, or part of the reason why we decided to add farms and, and, and start advocating for um, their, their needs and, and their desires. So um, yeah, it has been a bit of an evolution, but um, Obviously, it's one one that has proven to be successful. Because yeah, in twenty nineteen, we we had that great success with picking up an extra two seats. Um, that we now have three lower house seats and two upper house, um, which is quite significant. The first, first success was orange, wasn't it? In, in lower house seats. Yes, that yes, right? that's right. We don't. And, we and know I, that, I think that was a by election. Yeah. Yeah. But I think a lot of that came about from the, like you say, the nationals not doing their job. Uh, when Baird brought in, or brought in the amalgamation of, camp, uh, of the councils, which didn't go down that well in regional South Wales. And I think the other factor that played into it was the greyhounds in regards to, I think there was a four cornered show and that by the next day, Ed was basically saying, "All oh, greyhounds racing's got to stop. Ownership's got to stop," and, and just went bereft, sort of thing. Um, that, that must have sort of helped the cause a little bit. Yeah, look, it, it, it certainly did. Um, it did fire up quite a lot of lot of people, and um, it was a bit of a perfect storm, so to speak, with those two those two issues, and combine that with the feeling of neglect from a lot of people. So. Yeah, you know, and and as you as you said, it was it was all under the nationals' watch or, or doing. It was you know a national national party minister for local government that you know had previously spruced oh, we, he, that they didn't believe in um, council force council amalgamations, and then he the next day he was the one that was delivering that policy, and then and then yeah, as you said, you had the greyhound situation, and then a lot of our. Our, our greyhound trainers are out in our regions. Um, Orange has a great, great tradition of of, of great greyhound trainers. Um, so yeah, it was 
a, a perfect storm, um, you know, and that obviously helped us, but it, it's, I think particularly with the council on automation, there was quite a few vocal groups that just wanted to see anybody elected other than, you know, the, the government that had done this to them. So, um, you know, we were just the ones that were lucky to, in the end, pick up that seat. I think I Phil won that that by election by I think fifty votes. There was I think eleven or twelve recounts, but in twenty nineteen his seat was the first one declared. Um, so it sort of goes to show that you know, you know, uh, you know. Firstly, a we, we might have got a little bit lucky in terms of winning that seat firstly by fifty votes, but we certainly proved our worth and proved that we can actually represent a, an electorate properly because you know, Phil was able to grow his, his vote that substantially. Um, you know, he he won it, you know, hands down. Like, I, I, I think that night I was coming from Condoble and I was helping Roy out um, there. And by the time I got to the outskirts of Orange, the, the vote had already been declared. So I I walked into a, a, a party already already going on. Oh, in a way. Yeah, yeah. So... Oh, um, it, I mean, the national nationals have been that you know, just keep giving and giving uh, by keep aligning more and more with the liberals. And I mean, it's worse in Queensland. I mean, they actually amalgamated with the liberals back in two thousand and eight. So, although um, some members identify themselves as nationals, I mean, they just belong to the head office down in Brisbane. So that's just a furphy. You know, they're, they're just doing whatever the uh, their masters down in Brisbane uh, are saying. Um, do you think <laughs> nationals are just giving and giving now that they're going for uh, uh, net zero uh, 2050? Do you, you think that's something for regional um, mine, people contesting seats in, in regional areas? Is that something that the miners can uh, really hone in on and say, well, this is the difference between us and the and this and the city city connected nationals, we're going to actually fight for your jobs, and we're going to sort of fight for your industries and that, and we we're going to fight against uh, uh, zero a net zero. You think think that's that's on the cards, or or will everyone just roll over to twenty fifty? You know, I, I don't think everyone will just roll over. We I don't think we certainly won't roll over. Um, I think. You know, I know the Nationals federally have come out and claimed that they've negotiated this great deal, but I think the proof will be in the pudding as to whether you know, those, those concessions actually eventuate and history would tell you that they're probably not going to. Um, okay. I think in the past, you know, concessions around these, these sort of topics have, haven't eventuated um, and it's our farmers and our people in the regions that have, have suffered. Um, so I think it, I think it will be something that becomes a an election topic federally um, in our regions. Just on that, I mean, even if the if the nationals won say two hundred and fifty billion dollars over ten years to spend in the in the bush, but isn't that still selling out the nation in regards to you? The only way you can do it is take take money from one one set of people and give it to another rather than sort of just getting on with the job. Uh, and uh, Most people see through it. They see through, well, yeah, the government's giving away money, but it's giving away our money, you know, and, and what are we getting for it? So you, it can still co uh, create angst. So it's pro probably not going to do them a lot, a lot of good in the long run. No, well, look, I think it's, I think you're right. It's, 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 it's cutting the pie a different way instead of growing the pie. <laughs> and I, th I think I think good governments should be focused on growing the pie, so everyone gets a greater share, rather than, you know, cleverly cutting it, cutting it a, a different way to create the impression that, you know, you know someone's been someone's been looked after. Um, you know, I think every, you know everyone deserves to be looked after equally. Um, so, you know, and the what, the best way you do that is by growing the pie for everybody, and you. <laughs> You don't you don't do that by shutting down industries over uh, overnight with no viable or really credible viable alternative. I think the other thing is in, in regards to growing the pie. There's a lot of 
money is spent in regards to when there's a bit of a crisis. Like if the DFC um, was a crisis on and there was a massive debt. So the solution was to spend money, but they spent it on, you know, pink bats and school, school um, pay areas and that, but nothing that creates wealth. And it's the same thing when we've had this um, uh they just bit of COVID. The first first instance they do is you know chuck money into the home building industry. But all right, it keeps people employed, but it's it still doesn't grow wealth. And they continue to focus on the short term fix rather than any any uh, long term vision to give us a multi billion dollar you know ten twenty billion dollar project that's actually going to deliver wealth. Yeah, well, I think I, I, I totally agree with you. And as a teacher, former teacher that uh, lived through the um, building the education revolution, um, <laughs> that was one of the greatest farces um, in in history. Um, you know, you know, mi million dollars being spent on buildings that you know really looked like my brother-in-law's three-car garage. Like, yeah, and these were these were apparently you know, language centers and, you know, they were essentially four walls and an interactive whiteboard um, and we'll be in charge of the earth for it. Um, and as you said, what did that deliver in terms of, you know, wider long-term wealth generation or, or benefits to the community? And the answer is none. Um, and, and you're right. And same thing with this COVID um, resourcing, you know, or in terms of funding, um, you know, it, it hasn't generated or helped wide range of people like the, the job saver in new south wales i had people complaining to me that you know out of 13 jobs it saved them one job you know so 12 jobs were gone and that's 12 people that weren't spending in the in the economy um because they didn't have it they didn't have a job so um yeah we're not we're not spending wisely um we're not in, you know when these issues crop up um we're the stimulus that we we're putting out isn't, you know, I guess you utilized to its maximum benefit. Um, you know, as you, you use the the building, the home building example um, in New South Wales, the the building industry has been propping up the economy or artificially inflating the New South Wales economy for quite a few years now. Um, so, and I think the government's been a little bit obsessed with trying to keep that going to make themselves look good. Um, which is, I think, is why they, you know, put that investment in New South Wales with COVID into into that industry because they wanted to keep that ticking over. The other thing is too now that both the federal governments and the state governments have accrued massive debts out of COVID. It's even more imperative that we come up with projects that grow the pie. So I don't know who can whip, whip them into shape in regards to get them to focus on that. But if they don't actually get these major projects either up here we've got got a project that's been on the drawing board uh iron boomerang which is basically across the uh, uh, transcontinental railway way line from west to east taking coal one way uh iron all the other way and steel plants on both ends i mean that's value adding and it's and it's and it's wealth creating but i can't get a guernsey but uh, as a major project, but a hypothetical project like uh, hydrogen, because it's renewable, it gets um, major project status without any problem, even though it has, they haven't even really got a concept and they haven't got a market. So this goes to show you how fickle the government is in regards to things. But we've run, a, run a, away with more than an hour now, so we'd like to wrap up. But um, after your tenders, timber industry um, inquiry and you get some good results uh, yeah, we go to become the shooters fishers farmers and foresters <laughs> <laughs> oh look you you, you, you you never know we always get asked what are we gonna what letter are we gonna add next um you know but we might might cause people that has have lisps a bit of a problem if we keep adding s's and f's f's <laughs> to our name um but look i, I, I I think the point is that um, you know we we um, I guess pick up and run with um, issues um, that a lot of other parties 
have just put in the too hard basket. Um, we've off, we often get referred to as the um, patron saint of lost causes. We just keep <laughs> fighting, you know, like the Greyhounds is a classic example. The, the, the taxi industry in New South Wales is another example that we're working on. Um, but we don't necessarily need to put the, them in our names, but you know, the people that are in those industries knows, know that they're part of our family. Um, you know, even if their name isn't mentioned because they see the action on the ground from us and we're not just talking about it. Um, as I, I've said, we actually put, try and put things in place. We move legislation, we, you know, um, and essentially try and force the government's hand to actually do, do things that they should be doing already. So, but, but I think, I think the opportunity lies in the regions for your party in regards to you're never going to get the votes in the inner cities of, of Sydney and, and that sort of place. And the people who are the most seem to be the most elected at the moment are people in the region. And I'm pretty sure they, they whinge all the time about it. I was sort of, it, it comes up all the time that they, um, you know, like you said, they get a, get a raw deal. And this is becoming more and more entrenched in their mind. So that, that is obviously the uh, field that's probably open to you. So I hope you do focus on the regions, um, support them. And uh, I know you've got an uh, association in, in Queensland, in uh, uh, I think uh, Malcolm Richards is the secretary. I'm not sure who the president is. But I hope they sort of can get a bit of legs in the future and... Uh, Sort of work their way up north to North Queensland and sort of actually get in the mix come the 2024 election. Yeah, look, that that's that's definitely the definitely the goal. Um, we're definitely focused on the regions, and you know, as you said, they are being neglected, and that's um, you know, they're you know, it's, they're well within their rights to whinge and, and complain, and and um, our job is to listen to that and and take it take it up with the um the government of the day and. Um, look, hopefully we can get some traction in, in Queensland as well. It's a little bit dif difficult only having one house, um, you know, but we, we certainly will will try. There are plenty of issues up there that we can tackle. Um, I, know, I know recently the, the fishermen up there have been concerned about the, the decision around mackerel, Spanish mackerel. Um, so that's certainly some space for us to, to work in. Um, I think the government's working through every species of fish. <laughs> yeah yeah and look, that, that does concern us because particularly spanish mackerel you know we it, it sort of that sort of flows into new south wales um so we, we are watching that decision very closely um so yeah we are we are concerned of, about that and as you said yeah they, they'll work through every species um <laughs> find a problem with them so Okay, well, look, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Um, we've been going for a little bit, bit of overtime, but if you can just stay on the line, I'll have a little chit chat off air, yeah. um, but I'll just wrap, wrap up the show now. No problems. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Mark. If you have enjoyed tonight's show, please like, share, subscribe to our Facebook uh, channel, our regional wrap, or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, next week, we'll be having on... Uh, a belated uh, episode from uh, with Peter Harris and, and the uh, Australian representatives and Glenn O'Rourke from the Australian Federation Party to give us give us a little bit of an insight in regards to their, their plans for um, growing as a minor party and also working with other minor parties to emerge and create larger entities. So if you want to join me again, please join me next week. Thank you.